All right, I have 12 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to Medical Grand Rounds here at the University of Colorado. Before I introduce Dr. Sarah Stella, uh, just a couple of announcements. The first is uh, not an announcement that's going to surprise anybody, but I want to make uh, a little reminder here. COVID is obviously very much on the rise right now. Uh, we have county-wide test positivity rates in the 10% range at University of Colorado Hospital, they're closer to 13 to 14%, meaning this also is not going to abate for some time. I just wanted to remind everyone, uh, you'll see a lot of announcements from the Department of Medicine, you'll see announcements from your divisions, uh, ways that we can help each other, and of course, ways that we can help ourselves. And for anybody interested in COVID-19 resources, those exist on the Department of Medicine faculty website. Uh, you can go to COVID-19 tab at the top right-hand side, and under that is also a wellness tab. Uh, for resources to help yourself and your colleagues. Uh, so let's all please stay safe. I want to remind everybody that this uh, and all medical grand rounds this year are eligible for MOC and CME credit. So please use the link that Kelly Redard will place in the chat to uh, claim your credit. And anybody attending all of the grand round sessions this year will get about 40 mock points, which is more than you need in a year, which is great. And then finally, please use the Q&A section of the Zoom uh, chat to ask questions of Dr. Stella as the talk is ongoing, myself and the chief residents will gather those questions. We'll save them to the end and then we'll have a conversation uh, with Sarah at the end of this talk. And so now I will introduce Dr. Sarah Stella. Uh, she's an associate professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine here at the University of Colorado. And she's a member of the Division of Hospital Medicine at Denver Health. She did her undergraduate work as well as her medical school at Michigan State University. And then she was an intern and resident in the training program here at the University of Colorado. Um, I wrote down all of her awards. I wasn't sure which ones I was going to mention because they are numerous. She is an inductee of the AOA uh, Medical Society. She's also uh, was named the Society of Hospital Medicine Outstanding Service Award nominee. She's been named the Denver Health uh, Hospital Medicine Scholarship Excellence Award. She's received commendations for caring for the disadvantaged. Um, and maybe one of the ones I thought was most impressive is uh, she was uh, named the Denver Health Values uh, Living the Value of Compassion. Uh, awardee several years ago. She holds numerous leadership roles at Denver Health and nationally. She's the lead physician for the Complex Patient Flow Initiative at Denver Health. She's also the co-lead for the City of Denver Joint Task Force for the COVID-19 response. She's a well-known educator here on campus and is one of the co-directors and founders of the Health Equity Pathway within the residency program. Uh, her current work is actively funded by grants from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And today, Dr. Stella is going to talk to us about her work and her passion, uh, untangling the safety net for patients experiencing homelessness, advancing health equity through community partnerships. Dr. Stella. Thanks so much for that introduction, Dr. Connors. And hi, everybody. Um, I am really excited to uh, share with you today um, my passion for advancing health equity through, <clears throat> excuse me, community partnerships. Um, research and advocacy. And a shout out to my uh, academic and community partners um, on uh, the, the call and thanks so much for supporting me. Um, so here is, oops. Uh, here's um, some learning objectives for our talk today. So we're first going to um, review some um, sort of homelessness 101 data. So we're all on the same page discuss some root causes and some of the systemic drivers of homelessness. And then we'll um, understand um, the impact of homelessness on health outcomes and the patients that we see, as well as evidence for uh, supportive housing as a foundation for health. And then I'll share with you some uh, exciting uh, community momentum and opportunities which are um, happening in Colorado and uh, in Denver as well as nationally um, to improve uh, the health of um, patients experiencing homelessness through cross-sector collaborations. And I will be, um, so I read a, a recent review by Toe and colleagues um, a few weeks ago, um, and it was um, kind of sobering. It was looking at the number of, uh, it was looking at um, sort of a review of what's out there in the medical um, curricula right now that we're teaching our, our students and our residents about homelessness. Um, and it really showed that, um, not surprisingly, there's a lot of opportunities for improvement. Um, there's a lot of stereotypes that we propagate through um, our attempts to uh, teach this. Uh, and 
I think um, the, the way we present um, people experiencing homelessness is sometimes as a, a voiceless, uh, nameless um, individual. And so I'm going to do my best throughout this presentation to not um, fall into that trap. I have uh, all the photos and stories and quotes I'm going to share today are shared with permission from community partners and organizations. And I have changed um, some names and details to protect confidentiality. So I'm going to start with a case uh, of a tangled safety net. So this is a story of Carla, who I met in 2018. Uh, she's a 45-year-old woman uh, with a history of hypertension, obesity, and an umbilical hernia with um, some previous hernia surgeries. She re relocated to Denver and she's working uh, in one of the large hotels downtown as a pastry chef. A few weeks into her employment there, she um, it becomes ill. She develops an incarcerated hernia, um, develops uh, sepsis, and is admitted to a Denver area hospital. She has a prolonged hospitalization with multiple, an ICU stay um, for sepsis, multiple abdominal surgeries. And during that time, she loses her income and she's evicted from her apartment. Uh, she's subsequently discharged to the streets and kind of newly homeless on the streets and in shelters of Denver. And here's what she had to say about that. They had three months to find me somewhere to go. There's no reason why I should have been on the streets with my belly cut open from here to there and all that stuff, you know, a huge open wound. So let's start with some, some definitions because I think that the definitions um, around homelessness and, and housing insecurity can, can be a little bit squirrely. So um, in 1987, the McKinney Homeless Assistance Act defined a homeless person as someone who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence and who lives in a shelter or a place not designated for human habitation. This was um, expanded in 2009 through the Hearth Act to include people at risk of um, imminently losing their housing and fleeing domestic violence without adequate resources to obtain permanent housing. Uh, a chronically homeless person is defined by um, HUD as an individual with a disabling condition who has been either continuously homeless for at least one year or has had at least uh, four episodes of homelessness in the past three years. And then housing insecurity is really an umbrella term which encompasses um, both literal homelessness and a very broad range of unstable housing situations. So um, I think that the, the term homeless people really uh, implies a static sort of uh, heterogeneous or homogeneous um, population when in reality, people experiencing homelessness are a remarkably diverse community of people, both in terms of racial and ethnic diversity, as well as in their reasons for becoming homeless and in their patterns of homelessness. So in my experience, um, I've met people who have spent their entire lives um, living in poverty um, and, and chronically homeless many of much of that time. And I've also met people with advanced degrees um, who had careers cut short by mental illness, addiction, or just bad luck. Uh, and I think that uh, this quote here by a patient on my, one of my community advisory panels uh, really captured that sentiment very effectively. So there's a lot of interest in how do we denominate this population that's experiencing homelessness um, so that we, we can identify uh, patients for care coordination and improved care delivery? Um, how do we identify people? And the, the answer is that it's, it's complicated. Um, and so, um, the, um, and it really depends on, you know, the, the method that you're using um, and the definition of homelessness. But one of the data points that we do have is looking at point in time counts. Um, point in time surveys are conducted, uh, are mandated by housing and urban development and conducted all across the United States by different continuums of care. And 
Um, this is literally where volunteers uh, go out across um, cities and regions and are counting uh, people experiencing homelessness uh, wherever they are, in shelters or other places um, and on the streets. Um, and importantly, this, this uh, point in time estimates, so they give us sort of a snapshot of homelessness on a single night. They're usually conducted in January when a lot of people are inside um, in shelters and easier to, to count because they're congregating. Um, but point in time counts don't actually include people that are um, spending the night in jail in hospitals um, or in detox facilities. And so I know where my, uh, many of my patients, um, are on, um, January 20th, um, when it's cold outside. And so that is a limitation of the data. Um, when we look at, um, other estimates of homelessness, uh, provided by HUD through something called the homeless management information system, uh, that is looking at people who utilize shelters and other homeless services. And just to give you an example of the discrepancy in this, some of this data, uh, the last uh, two, uh, HUD annual homeless assessment report to Congress in 2018 um, found that there were there were 1.4 million people um, in the sheltered HMIS count versus 500,000 by point in time estimate. So. A lot of advocates in the community believe that, you know, a homelessness, you probably multiply the point in time counts by three, um, and that's something closer to the real number. Um, so you can see again in Colorado, um, there are nearly um, nearly 10,000 people experienced homeless, literal homelessness on a single night in January 2020. And this is um, prior to the first surge of the COVID um, pandemic. Uh, the McKinney-Vento Act uh, also um, uh, requires that uh, Department of Education keep track of, uh, of students that are experiencing homelessness. And you can see that the last time we have good uh, data on school year, 2018, 2019, there were 23,000 uh, students, more than 23,000 students experiencing homelessness. And then if we look at people who are applying to um, Medicaid, in 2019, uh, 53,000 people reported unstable housing. Now there's different definitions there, but you can just see some of the complexities of um, trying to denominate this population. Um, and at Denver Health, we're actually um, doing um, some um, phenotyping, some um, housing and security phenotyping to try to better denominate um, our population. Um, so if we look at the, this is again, point in time data for Colorado. So of those um, nearly 10,000 people who were literally homeless um, in 2020, there was about 8,000 uh, individuals, um, more than 2,000 people um, in families with children, um, veterans and unaccompanied youth, as well as um, uh, a large proportion of chronically homeless individuals. When we look at where people are staying, um, about 70% of people reported being sheltered versus about 30% being unsheltered. And this is what the data looks like for our Metro Denver continuum of care. Um, so you can see homelessness is increasing um, and we've seen some worrisome trends um, across 2020 and 2021 with increase in the number of unsheltered uh, populations. Uh, and I think that's sort of multifactorial. So um, individuals know that, you know, they're at higher risk for COVID-19 staying in shelters. Um, and there's also a lot of um, newly homeless people. So the um, number of newly homeless people um, never accessing HMIS or homeless management information system or shelter services before doubled from 2020 to 2021 in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and just a reminder, this is, um, I like this picture because it is a snapshot um, taken um, around uh, outside of one of uh, our large uh, shelters. And this is um, where some of our uh, patients are, are sleeping. And I also like that this, um, the wheelchair in this picture, because it reminds me of the level of vulnerability that um, our patients experiencing homelessness face. 
Um, and just a reminder that um, we can't talk about homelessness um, in this country without um, talking about uh, racism. And so um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are overrepresented in homeless populations, including in Denver. So in Denver, 21% um, of people experiencing homelessness surveyed um, in the point in time survey identified as Black and 3% three identify, 3 identified as Native American or um, American Indian. That's over four times the proportion of Black and Native American um, individuals in the general population. So like our patient Carla, um, many of our patients have situational barriers to maintaining housing stability. Um, and um, these are, you know, some of, just some of um, the reasons that um, the barriers that people may face. Um, on the, the figure here on the right is actually looking at um, ad adverse childhood experiences, the number of adverse childhood ex uh, experiences with lifetime risk of adult homelessness. And you can see sort of a dose response relationship with the number of ACEs. Um, and I've, I've heard this um, phrase from my community or this um, quote from my community partners. We, we don't know who said it originally, but I think it's a really uh, important and powerful quote, which is that um, homelessness is often the, or um, uh, trauma is often the cause, um, but always the result of homelessness. And homelessness is a, is a wicked problem. Um, it's about um, complex and broken systems. So this is um, a, a map basically showing um, um, that there is a huge shortage of affordable uh, homes. There's about 7 million, um, a national shortage of 7 million affordable and available rental units for low income and extremely low income um, individuals. And so no state actually has an adequate supply of affordable and available rental housing for the lowest income renters. Um, and you can see Colorado um, ranks actually eighth in the nation as the least affordable state with only 30 affordable and available rental homes per 100 extremely low income renter households um, needed. Um, and then if, I don't know if anyone knows this, maybe some of our residents might know this. Um, uh, if you know, uh, if you can type into the chat, um, if you know this, the hourly wage that a household has to earn to afford a two bedroom apartment in Colorado. And this is actually um, a figure depicting the percent increase in median home values, rents with median income in Denver. And so you can see that um, rents and home values have consistently risen since 2012, uh, and that this has substantially outpaced income growth. And we know that um, BIPOC communities are disproportionately impacted and cost burdened by their housing. And so um, someone we, we consider severe cost burden is um, someone who spends more than half of their income on their housing. Um, and so you can see that, um, that um, the, some of the racial and ethnic disparities we have. So 20% um, of black households, 18% of Native American households and 14% of households uh, Latino households versus only 6% of white households are severely cost burdened. And only about one in four households who qualifies for rental assistance receives it. So there's a lot of opportunities here to prevent homelessness. Um, so Howard Coe, the Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health and the former Assistant Secretary of Health uh, and Human Services um, uh, actually, he's, yeah, so he's at Harvard um, now. Um, he described uh, homelessness as one of the great, greatest health equity challenges of our times. And I agree with him. Um, and I think most of us um, probably do. So um, homelessness is associated with um, significant health inequities and worse health outcomes across a very broad spectrum of um, chronic condition of conditions. 
So um, people experiencing homelessness have um, high rates of both acute and chronic diseases like diabetes, COPD. Um, and uh, they also have high rate. So about 40%, um, over 40% of people experiencing homelessness um, report having at least one health condition. Um, and, and many actually have sort of multi-morbid um, chronic health conditions, um, including um, co-occurring mental health and substance use conditions. There's a lot of ranges presented in the literature around, um, uh, around mental health, um, rates of mental health um, conditions in the homeless community. Um, but it's estimated that about a quarter of um, patients um, may have a serious mental illness. Um, we know that our patients who are unhoused have higher rates of um, infections, including HIV, hepatitis C, tuberculosis, uh, and COVID-19 and, and others. And so over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had um, outbreaks um, in our um, unhoused populations in Denver of hepatitis A, Shigella, and um, Bartonella, Quintana as well. Um, so a, a lot of, um, of our patients are living in conditions where it makes um, it, infectious diseases are highly uh, transmissible, including COVID. Uh, many of the patients that we see uh, in the acute health um, care setting um, are have um, exposure related um, injuries um, and conditions. And this is true for both, particularly for people living unsheltered, uh, but people living um, in the summer um, when we had like this, a lot of smoke coming into Denver, we saw increase in um, respiratory um, complaints and exacerbations of cardiovascular disease. And then, of course, um, this picture on the right is something that I think um, those of us who work in the hospital and the emergency department see um, frequently uh, in the inpatient um, setting. Um, homelessness is an independent risk factor for death, and the risk of death is consistently two to five times higher than in the general population. Um, and concerningly, this is actually people in younger age groups uh, and women um, tend to have higher mortality rates. And this is um, attributable to um, infectious um, diseases, chronic heart disease, uh, substance use, and unintentional injuries. And already this year, we've had um, 160, um, around 160 deaths in the homeless uh, community in Denver, um, and a lot, we're seeing a lot of overdose uh, deaths. And so there has been some shifting over time um, since like earlier studies um, over a decade ago, uh, but in terms of the cause of mortality, but we actually haven't really seen um, a decrease in the mortality rate. It's just sort of shifting to more um, substance use uh, and overdose deaths. Um, and and um, we also know that um, that um, individuals who are um, experiencing chronic homelessness have a decreased life expectancy that is nearly uh, 30 years shorter than the average uh, U.S. life. And the homeless population is aging. And so baby boomers have an increase. Uh, lifetime risk of homelessness. Um, and so people are um, aging. Uh, and um, a group of researchers in Oakland, um, actually, um, Margot Cushell and others have studied this extensively. Um, and this is a study looking at uh, 350 uh, homeless adults aged around 50 years old um, or older in a variety of living um, environments, including shelters, transitional housing, and um, unsheltered populations. And she, um, they found basically that, um, I think not surprisingly to, to many of us um, who, who um, care for um, patients that the prevalence of um, the geriatric conditions, so frailty syndromes, um, 
were very common. And in fact, um, the prevalence of these conditions in this population is actually higher than that seen in um, some housed populations um, 20 years or um, 20 years older. So this is a graph looking at uh, activities of daily living, um, functional deficits in people um, experiencing homelessness from that study. Um, and you can see that um, almost half had difficulty performing ADLs, um, a large number of reported falls, a quarter had cognitive impairment, um, and uh, as well as other um, high, high proportion of other uh, impairments. And I think that um, if you want to see this in Denver, uh, my recommendation is to go um, to the Coliseum, to the Denver Coliseum while it's um, still opened and get to know some of the, um, the residents that are um, sheltering there during COVID. Um, because many of our shelters um, who are uh, housing uh, these elder, older patients who are frail um, are, are under a lot of stress um, and, and they need our help. Uh, and then this is looking at, um, we know that uh, people experiencing homelessness um, have decreased utilization of primary care and higher utilization of emergency um, departments and hospitals as their primary source of care. Um, they tend to have um, higher um, acute care costs as well. So when they're, they're five times more likely to be hospitalized and uh, when hospitalized have a longer length of stay by over a day um, uh, and tend to have um, higher costs associated with their hospitalization. And they're also um, have a much higher risk of being re-hospitalized within 30 days. Um, there have also been very well described um, uh, disparities in in-hospital care and mortality. Um, so this is a study that um, some of you might have read uh, in JAMA Internal Medicine uh, last year. And this is looking at um, disparities in receipt of um, uh, in cardiovascular interventions like um, uh, angiograms, PCI, and cabbage. Um, and so on unhoused patients are less likely to receive these life setting, uh, life saving interventions. And this is um, associated with a um, uh, increase in mortality. Um, and I think this is like an interesting study to me because I think that there's a lot of additional questions that and follow up studies that we can. Um, do to try to understand um, the, the complex um, reasons for this from a variety of perspectives, from the perspective of both patients, as well as um, healthcare providers that are caring for them. So if anyone wants, um, if any of the residents um, want to um, a study idea, um, come, come chat with me. Um, this is um, a slide just illustrating that um, throughout the COVID um, pandemic, uh, our patients that are experiencing homelessness have tripled the risk of hospitalization compared to the uh, general population. And so we've kind of seen that um, throughout uh, the pandemic. So um, people experiencing homelessness are a real, really critical part of Denver Health's population and mission. <laughs> In uh, 2020, we cared for nearly 7,000 um, patients experiencing homelessness who accounted for uh, over 24,000 visits. Um, and you know, homelessness, as we've said, is a really, is a wicked problem and wicked problems can really only be eventually solved through um, sustainable partnerships. And so, um, Denver Health and the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless care for a large shared homeless population. And we've committed to um, more intentionally partnering to um, effectively um, do this. So um, just to give you kind of a, a, um, a look at like um, how important um, this is and kind of where you might start thinking about partnerships in your organization, um, this um, figure shows, um, this is an encounters from 2018, hospital encounters um, for uh, adult homeless patients discharged from medicine, uh, surgery, and psychiatry services. 
And you can see that um, although there's a large unestablished patient population who's not receiving primary care, um, about a quarter of our patients um, or a quarter of these encounters, the primary care um, medical home was the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Um, and so back in 2018, um, I was um, really wanting to, to better understand the issues um, in our community um, related to homelessness and understand a different perspective than the one I had caring for people in the inpatient setting. Um, and that led me to uh, reach out um, to leaders at the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless and um, apply for a pilot grant to really um, uh, build a relationship with them. And um, this involved a um, setting up a community advisory panel, which included uh, both individuals with who were, who were currently homeless at that time or had lived experience of homelessness, as well as uh, community stakeholders that I, as a hospitalist, didn't have a lot of direct interaction with, um, including um, uh, street outreach workers, people working in shelters, um, case management, people at the Stout Street Health Center. Um, and we um, came away with, um, this was really a, a, um, a life-changing and career-changing um, experience um, for me um, because it really helped me understand all the blind spots that we have and how valuable um, academic community partnerships can be. So these are just some of the themes that um, came out of that community advisory panel, which um, kind of turned into opportunities um, for meaningful change. So uh, folks talked a lot about, uh, folks with lived experience talked a lot about the trauma that they had experienced through um, being homeless, but also through healthcare um, that they had received. Um, and service providers talked a lot about the, the substantial gaps in care and the lack of integration and coordination of care transitions um, and, and how that contributed to um, poor health outcomes. <laughs> Um, additionally, um, folks experiencing homelessness talked a lot about um, how social isolation and limited support during and after hospitalization um, contributed to um, them having a lot of a lot of problems after, and how this is a um, a potential opportunity for uh, improvement. So, thinking about the support that we give, um, not only um, during the care transition, but um, but across, um, but during hospitalization, I, I see a lot of opportunities uh, for that and have worked on um, some um, subsequent work around providing um, things like peer support for uh, patients that are hospitalized experiencing homelessness. Um, so as I mentioned, this uh, partnership between Denver Health and the Colorado Coalition um, has, um, this initial work has really, <laughs> Um, identified a lot of opportunities and priorities to improve care and resulted in a more formal partnership uh, to Im improve um, care transitions and um, data sharing. Um, we have partnered together uh, as an academic and community uh, organization on some stri uh, strategic planning uh, and um, we also have participated in uh, Center for Healthcare Strategies Rising Risk Work Group, looking at how to understand uh, rising risk in, in the homeless community and actually um, had the opportunity to pilot a, a supportive housing intervention that we um, jointly developed through that work. Um, we've worked together throughout the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, on um, this with a number of other community partners um, on um, this multifaceted response in the homeless community. And then um, most recently, we um, are partnering on some joint uh, research, um, looking at how to, under, how to understand um, uh, what people need to be successful and really thrive in, in housing, um, as well as some um, additional um, work in the uh, supportive housing space. 
So back to Carla's story. So she uh, was homeless on the streets um, for probably a year. Um, during one of her hospitalizations, um, she, um, a, a hospital social worker helped her sign up for Medicaid uh, and got her connected with a case manager at the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, and that's kind of when her, um, her story begins to um, shift. So um, following getting on disability, uh, she has now has an income and she's eligible for a housing voucher program. So she's housed through a scattered site housing voucher program and begins to engage in substance use, substance use treatment. Um, and this is kind of her um, perspective on what it's like as you're transitioning into housing, um, which sounds like it'd be a good thing, um, but let's hear her perspective. So she says, clean and sober, we have a lot of emotions that you have to deal with. And when you're high, you don't do emotions. So once you come off, you're bombarded and it's overwhelming. And that makes you realize how now you can feel, but that also causes more trauma. So I wanna shift gears um, a little bit and talk about um, just a high level um, overview of some of the housing um, funding streams um, in Colorado. And so when we think of um, funding for housing and vouchers, um, there are really um, two buckets. Um, so one is um, HUD. Um, so federally money is flowing through the Office of Community Development and Planning, which flows to our uh, continuums of care, which are uh, regional planning bodies um, whose role is really to coordinate um, the um, disbursement of funds for homeless programs. Um, and we have four continuums of care in Colorado. Um, these funding streams and vouchers are typically geared more towards people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and so they tend to be kind of less restrictive and more low barrier. Um, however, they require uh, uh, continuums of care to use coordinated entry systems, which use standardized assessment tools to prioritize people experiencing homelessness uh, for housing on a central wait list. So you've probably heard some of your patients talk about being on the wait list, um, and that's often what they're referring to. Um, HUD funding also comes from uh, the Office of Indian and Public Housing through public housing authorities. Uh, and the, real, the, the role of public housing authorities is largely to uh, coordinate um, or administer the Section 8 housing voucher program. Uh, and some also operate um, some public housing neighborhoods. And so Colorado has a variety of local uh, and state, um, and actually state uh, public housing authority um, and then local funds. So these are city and state funds that um, are, are um, designated um, sources of um, funding for um, housing and other homeless services. So measure 2B, uh, which um, passed um, in the last two years uh, was, was a Denver measure. Um, and that um, is going to generate an estimated uh, $40 million per year uh, for this homelessness resolution fund, um, which uh, will be used for um, housing initiatives, outreach and support to get people into housing. Um, there's also the, um, so the Division of Local Affairs, um, uh, DOLA, um, also uh, administers a, house, a state housing voucher program, which is funded by a marijuana tax revenue. And that um, there's been some initiatives to try to in, um, house individuals who um, are high needs, like people with mental illness, people moving out of institutions. Um, and when we look at the impact of um, supportive housing, um, so we can't mitigate the harms of homelessness and, unless we can get people um, stable in, 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 in their housing. 
Um, and there's been um, a number of randomized controlled trials now that have shown that um, people experiencing homelessness um, with chronic health conditions uh, who receive permanent supportive housing um, spend significantly fewer days homeless than those who receive usual care. And this might sound sort of self-explanatory, or like this might be kind of obvious, um, but it actually wasn't obvious. So back in um, uh, the Pathways to Housing first uh, study in New York was one of the first um, studies to show this. Um, and they had individuals with um, that were high utilizers, um, had a lot of substance use um, and a dual mental health diagnosis. And they basically randomized them to um, unconditional housing through this housing first model versus uh, treatment first, where they were required to um, be, their, their housing was continued on sobriety, and they basically found that um, housing first is superior. And there's been a number of other studies that have shown that. Um, when we look at um, the health, um, health outcomes and the impact of permanent supportive housing, um, we have a number of studies that have been done. So uh, the, there's been studies that have indirectly looked at um, how the provision of permanent supportive housing reduces um, ED and hospitalizations and costs in high needs populations. Um, and that tends to be, that effect tends to be higher in uh, populations that um, are high utilizing to begin with. Um, so that's kind of indirect evidence. Um, there is a, a good amount of evidence in HIV um, and looking at health outcomes, um, including some randomized control trials that have found that um, housing, um, supportive housing improves um, disease control and actually one that shows improve, improved mortality. Um, there's been other studies that have looked at well being um, and quality of life and, and found uh, improvements. Um, but there are a number of studies that are sort of mixed. Um, and I think what to me that says is number one, like maybe we're not studying things, we're not studying um, the right things, um, or we're not asking the right questions or using the right measures, or we're not using measures that are sensitive to the time frame that we're looking at in these studies. Um, but I think it also may mean that, um, you know, housing is necessary, but not necessarily sufficient um, for achieving health and thriving. And I think that's where um, we can play um, a big role in, in thinking about how to partner and um, work towards that. Um, this is a study. Um, this is some um, data from the Corporation for, for Supportive Housing looking at um, costs of public services. So things like um, shelter costs, detox services, um, criminal justice like jail stays um, in, in three and six um, cities throughout the United States and basically showing that um, supportive housing uh, decreases costs in, in um, that sector. So, I think a big limitation of um, housing is that it's a really expensive intervention and uh, especially to scale. Um, and so a lot of cities um, across the country, including Denver, are looking at um, how do we how do we use um, mechanisms to fund this um, effectively? And so um, social impact bonds or pay for success uh, models. There's a growing number of these happening to fund um, housing programs. And so this is where a local government partners with an in intermediary who um, gets um, investors to raise capital. Um, they partner with a service provider with a track record of success um, in providing housing. Um, they deliver services to a defined population in need. And then there's an independent evaluation of the results and um, payment um, repayment for, based on um, on whether they achieve their um, outcome measures. So Denver, um, I know many of you have um, heard about this initiative, but Denver has um, a social had a very a successful social impact bond. So this was. Uh, a project where the city uh, partnered with eight different investors 
um, to um, try to improve um, uh, costs um, and looked at housing stability and jail days as their outcome metrics. Um, and they focused on a population of um, people experiencing homelessness who were frequent utilizers of emergency services, including police, jails, courts, and emergency departments and detox facilities. And just to give you an idea of um, who these folks were, um, uh, the top utilizing, 250 of the top utilizers cost the city $7 million. Um, and so this um, was a five-year uh, randomized controlled evaluation design. Again, looking at stable housing and jail day reductions as the primary metrics. Um, so they also found um, that um, when people were offered housing, most took it um, and stayed for the long term. So uh, almost 80% in stable housing at three years. Um, and keep in mind that these are some of the highest utilizing um, individuals with um, also with a lot of um, health conditions and um, sudden mental health issues. Um, and then um, when we looked at, um, at um, criminal justice system utilization, um, there was a, a decrease, a substantial decrease in um, jail days, as well as police contacts and arrests. And then in a um, subsequent analysis of the subset that had Medicaid, they looked at emergency department um, visits and found decreased ED utilization and then an expected increase in outpatient office uh, care visits with a psychiatric diagnosis, as well as increase in medication suggesting increased adherence. Um, and so um, there is now um, a, um, we will be participating in an expansion of the social impact bond, um, which um, the city will be receiving um, funding for. Um, and we will focus on high utilizers of Denver Health's emergency department and likely detox uh, stays as well. That's very exciting. Um, since a large, another funding mechanism I wanted to just touch on is that, you know, a lot of patients experiencing homelessness um, have Medicaid. And so there um, is a lot of work going on to see how we can leverage Medicaid to support um, um, housing interventions um, to improve uh, health and dec decrease costs. Um, and there's a number of different mechanisms for uh, doing this through, through um, Medicaid, which I won't get into now, um, but have learned a lot about in preparation for this talk, um, the different authorities that exist. And basically um, Medicaid or cannot pay for like room and board, um, uh, but they can pay for um, some pre-tenancy services, kind of housing, search and location, um, helping people get moved in safely, and then also um, supportive wraparound services to keep uh, people successfully housed. Um, we had the opportunity to participate in a very small uh, pilot project um, involving Denver Health patients. Uh, who were um, at rising risk of uh, adverse health outcomes, utilization, and costs, and partnered with um, uh, Denver Health Medicaid and uh, the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless uh, to um, house people and then um, looked at um, kind of how people did um, throughout um, over the course of a year, um, looked at housing stability and a variety of other health outcomes. And I learned a lot from that. Um, we learned a lot of lessons um, about how it's uh, the importance of adapting um, the way we operate in our organizations for collaboration, um, in this case between Denver Health and the coalition, um, and but also like within our own organizations. Uh, and then we encountered some barriers to data sharing, um, which are um, important to consider in larger scale evaluations. So because of the unique contractual agreement um, within Colorado, Colorado Medicaid, um, we had some trouble getting um, all the claims data that we needed. Um, and then this also highlighted the need for specific levels of care within housing first. Um, and that's led to um, some joint um, research um, 
called Project Hope, um, which I will tell you about next time. Um, Medicaid has just announced that they are doing a project um, with um, Recovery Act funding, which will operationalize funding for supportive housing for 500 individuals with serious mental illness. Um, so that is a three-year initiative happening now. And the long-term mechanisms for how that will happen are um, currently unclear, but likely through one of the waivers um, that I was mentioning. Um, hospitals and large health systems are increasingly uh, becoming interested in um, investing in housing um, as a way both to improve um, the mission um, and as well as um, as well as the margin. And Denver Health um, is actually um, no exception to that. So we are partnering with uh, the Denver Housing Authority. Um, they purchased a large office building that we were no longer using on our campus and are converting that to senior and disabled housing. Um, and we will be leasing back um, one floor of that with the goal of decreasing avoidable length of stay and decreasing homelessness through connections to longer term housing supports. Um, I don't have time to go into this now because I want to have um, a little time for questions, but um, just to point out that um, the that there's been a lot of um, cool things that have happened related to kind of emerging housing models through the housing um, through the COVID pandemic. So the um, for the first time ever, FEMA funded um, housing for disaster housing for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and these are some of the non-congregate shelters that have been, um, have, that we've stood up in Denver and also in other um, places. Uh, and then this week, i um, excited to announce that Denver Health is uh, opening um, a, a safe outdoor space. In, um, well, we're not opening it, but we're partnering with the Colorado Village Collaborative who is opening uh, a safe outdoor space where we'll provide a lot of um, uh, services for um, some of our unsheltered community members. Um, just to close with uh, Carla's story. So um, she's doing really well. She's been housed for a number of years. She regained custody of her son. This is uh, a picture of uh, a birthday cake that she made for her son, um, which I think is uh, amazing. And I wanna take lessons from her. Um, but I will end there uh, and just with thanks um, to many people um, who have taught me so much and we'll take questions. Dr. Stella, thank you so much. Um, obviously an incredibly thoughtful and engaging talk um, and really appreciate you bringing this topic to, uh, to Medical Grand Rounds. There are more questions we have time for, not surprisingly. Um, the first comes, I, I believe, from our resident group um, and when we it says, when we think about homelessness as a determinant of health, how do we approach screening for it? How should we approach screening for it and uh, <clears throat> acting on it on the inpatient and outpatient settings, uh, especially if we work in healthcare systems that don't necessarily have such a, a supportive uh, staffing model uh, when the patients leave the hospital? Um, that is a great question. And I think that there's a lot of work going on related to how do, how do we screen for this? We know that we're not very good at screening for it. So there's been studies that have looked at, at like, do we even ask people anything about their housing um, situation? And often the answer is no, um, or we don't ask in enough detail. Um, so I think ultimately it matters who's asking and why you're asking, I would say, um, because obviously there's a lot of stigma um, around um, saying that you're you're homeless. Um, and so people often will give, um, they won't say they're homeless, but they'll give an address of um, like a homeless shelter, um, for instance, as their address. And so um, one approach is like just normalize, when you're talking to your patients, normalize it, ask them questions, be humble, be curious. And then from the data side, um, looking at um, not just like um, administrative data, but but data where this is documented like throughout the health record in bits and pieces and how do we, how do we improve that? Um, and um, how do we, um, 
how do we ask, like maybe we, we are in our clue in our definition that um, like Denver Health does that, you know, we look at geocoded data. So if someone says they're homeless, we include them. But also if someone says like, I live at 2323 Curtis Street at the coalition, we include them. But you still have to ask because it's a fluid thing. Another question that came from uh, our residents is there's a lot of moral distress among providers who care for people experiencing homelessness. And then on an individual level, what do you view as the role of the discharging provider or the role of the primary care provider in getting those patients stable housing? That's a great question. Um, and something that we explored in our community advisory panel, that was actually one of the big themes that came from um, providers was the, the, the moral distress and the burnout. Um, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but for me, I, I was experiencing um, a lot of moral distress and burnout back in 2018. Um, and my solution to that was to go outside of the hospital and go into the community and try to understand and try to develop relationships so that we don't have to do that. But I would say, you know, from an ethical standpoint and a moral standpoint, like we should never feel okay with discharging someone to the streets, yet we have to do it. Um, and so how do, we, how, do we not, how do we work towards a system where we don't have to do that? Um, and I think working in the community for me has been, has given me hope that um, it's not gonna be easy, but that, things will get better. And I think that the, the momentum that we're seeing with, you know, Medicaid operationalizing housing funding and new respite facilities being built um, are encouraging. One question about um, in the, uh, I guess, efforts to not reinvent the wheels. Um, are there things other states are doing that you could look at today and say, we should do that? Let's just import that entirely into Colorado. Um, also a great question. So there's been, there's a lot of states who are doing, the, um, doing work through Medicaid now. Um, so some of them are addressing housing through more broadly through like work on, um, on the social determinants of health in general, including housing, like North Carolina is a good example of that. Um, and there are other states who are, you know, piloting interventions that they hope to scale. Um, and then states like um, Hawaii, California, Washington, that really have scaled their approaches to um, providing supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness. So those are all like think, states to watch. And I can send, um, whoever asked the question, I can uh, correspond with you and send you some resources um, which talk about what um, this kind of experimentation that's happening right now. I think we have time for maybe one more question. <clears throat> and I'll ask this is the transitional housing and the housing supports that are gonna exist outside Denver Health obviously don't come without any controversy. Um, how do you engage with the community at large when you're trying to, to help others understand what you understand and, and help others understand the needs for these programs? Um, I would say I encourage people to go and visit. So a great example is like the safe outdoor spaces. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, people that think that that's a good thing, but just not in, not in my neighborhood. Um, and so my response is go, go and see it, go and check it out, see what, see what it is. Um, talk to people, understand what their concerns are. A lot of times, I think another good example of that is like the downtown Denver partnership. And like, you know, they have a lot of concerns around people living unsheltered on their thresholds. Um, and they wanna do something about this. Um, we want to do something about this. And I think that we have a lot more in common than we um, we give ourselves credit for. So trying to just empathize with and understand perspective, just getting outside of the clinic and the hospital, I think are um, really important. And being humble, like being the, it's okay not to, we're not the experts in this area and that's okay. I've learned so much from um, 
people that have become mentors to me that have a whole different perspective. It's great. Um, it's one o'clock. So to be respectful of everyone's time, yours included, Dr. Stella, thank you very much um, for bringing us this important topic. Thanks for everything that you do for our faculty and also for the residents uh, for whom I know you teach a lot of these topics. And I'll reiterate what you said, which is that people can reach out to you. Um, Absolutely. Act on these issues. Yep. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you all.